Amen. All right, Ruth chapter number two. And uh, let's start, let's, let's jump back there to verse number one. It says here, And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. So chapter two is starting off just giving us this information here the, of, uh, of who Boaz is, because we're going to meet him in this chapter. And um, Boaz is basically, he was a near kinsman of Elimelech. And Elimelech was Naomi's husband that, that died in the land of Moab. And it says here, he's, you know, he's a man of wealth. He's got a lot of money. He's got a lot of goods. And in verse 2, it says, And Ruth the Moabite said, and this is just like that, that first uh, verse there, that's just kind of like setting the stage. But um, Ruth doesn't realize who Boaz is until much later when Naomi explains that he's a near kinsman. It's just letting, you know, the Bible is just letting us know who Boaz is. And in verse number two, it says, And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. Now, excuse me, as we're going to see, as we saw a little bit in the first chapter, a little bit more here, we're going to see, we, we see a little bit more about Ruth's character, right? In chapter one, we saw how she was a, a, a great woman of God who, you know, who was going to stick by Naomi, her mother-in-law, and take care of her and go with her and into, her, into her own land. And she made, um, she left her father and mother and, and went into a land that she didn't know, but, um, and, she, and she stuck by her mother-in-law and took care of her. So now we see a little bit more of her character here. Because you see, she was willing to work hard and do whatever she could to help take care of herself and her mother-in-law since they were both widows. So she's saying, okay, well, let me now go out to the field. I'm going to go glean some ears of corn. And um, she was also humble when even just in her words, when she said, in whose sight I shall find grace, right? Grace from someone else just allowing her to say, okay, you could come in my field and do this work. So she was going out humbly, ready to work. And, and it's just a really good character trait that she has. Now, it was God's law actually to allow for this very situation. What she's doing is completely according to Scripture and the way that God had designed for, for widows, for the poor, for people to be taken care of so that you don't need, like we have today, this government assistance and the state taking care of people from the cradle to the grave. That's not the way God designed it at all. He designed this when what they're going out to do is completely scriptural to go out and glean the fields. Keep your finger in Ruth chapter 2. Turn back to Leviticus chapter number 19. Third book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. We're going to see where God kind of describes here um, the, the gleanings of the harvest. So what's gleaning anyways, right? Gleaning is when you go and... Um, you know, we have an apple tree out there. It's just getting started. But let's say, you know, let's say that apple tree was, was fully mature and it was full of fruit, right? And it's got, it's got all kinds of apples all over it. Well, gleaning that tree is going to be, hey, we're going to pick up like all of it. You're not going to see one last ap apple stuck to that tree. That would be, you're gleaning, you're, get, you're picking up every last little bit of fruit off of that tree. And what God basically did, we're going to read this here. He said, look, if you have a field, you have a vineyard, you know, you go out and you reap, you leave some of it behind. You don't go and get every last little piece of fruit and food that's out there. You need to leave some for the fatherless, for the widows, for the poor, you know, that they can eat too and that they can be taken care of. You got enough as it is. If you're going out and reaping a harvest from all this stuff, hey, be thankful for what you got. Don't go back and glean it. You don't go over it a second time and just make sure that you've, you've, you've picked up every last little bit. But we're look at, Le look at Leviticus chapter 19, and then we're going to go to Deuteronomy 24. Leviticus 19, verse number 9. Verse number 9, Leviticus 19 says, And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. And thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. A stranger is just like a foreigner. I am the Lord your God. So God's commanding them. This is a commandment from God saying, look, you need to leave some of this behind. 
And who is it for specifically? It's for the poor and it's for the strangers, the foreigners. I mean, people coming through your land, they need to be able to eat. Poor people need to eat. And I like God's method too because their, His method wasn't just for the poor to just be taken care of and you're going to go deliver it to their doorstep. Right? He didn't say if you have a field and there's someone poor, just go hand deliver it to their door and while they're still laying on their couch, go give them an ear of corn. Right? He didn't say that. No, it's for them to go out and do the gleanings themselves. They go out and do the work. Um, it's, it's similar in the New Testament. You know, the Bible says... Um, and um, if, if any man shall not work, neither shall he eat. And that's, that's a good philosophy, a good motto to live by. Hey, if you're not going to do the work, guess what? You're not going to eat. Okay, you need to get your rear end up and go and do some work. And hey, some people are legitimately poor. You know, you fall, you, you have, you know, different circumstances happen in your life. I mean, you, you might, for whatever reason, health problems, especially these days, you know, you, you just... You get hit with a with a big with a big debt or you know something that you owe um, because you had to get something taken care of, you know some some circumstance happened, and uh, you know you you wind up being poor, but God allows so that you can still be fed, you can still get taken care of by doing his gleanings, and you know and we see that with Ruth. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter twenty four. We're going to see again where God commands this in a little bit more detail in Deuteronomy twenty four. But Ruth is, has got character. She's humble. She's got her priorities straight. And she's willing to go out and do some work. And, and, and just to get that food as she's supposed to, as a widow, as a poor widow. That has no one taken care of her. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 24. Look at verse number 19 of Deuteronomy 24. 24, 19. The Bible reads, When thou cuttest down thine harvest in thy field, and hast forgot a sheaf in the field, Thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hands. He's saying, look, if you do this, look, you, you just leave that alone. You leave that for the fatherless. You, you don't need to go and run them off your field. That's what they're left for. Let them go get it, and then God's going to bless you for doing that. That's exactly what this verse says. He says that, that, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hands. Look at verse 20. When thou beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt, Therefore, I command thee to do this thing. And he's talking about people, especially here, who own a vineyard, who own an olive vineyard, right? These are people, they have a little bit of wealth, right? I mean, in order to have these fields and these vineyards, you know, and, and all this food source and stuff, like we saw Boaz, he's a man of great wealth. This is very, very important that for, for, uh, for especially for someone who has wealth, who has some money, to keep themselves humble, to not get lifted up with pride and, and, and getting greedy as well. You know I mean, there's a, there's a few things that go hand in hand here. See, the man that's got a lot of wealth, they might, they might start thinking, man, I like all this money that's coming in. Well, I want more. Well, let's go back and, and, and just get everything out of here because then they could go and sell even more of that food and make more money. Instead of saying no, God commands us, no, that is not for me. That is for these other people. That is for the poor. You're not going to be in bringing the poor into bondage, the widows, the fatherless, because you go back and glean up your own vineyards. And that's why he says in verse 22, you know, thou shalt remember, you know, don't forget, hey, you were a bondman. You were a slave. Yeah, you have a lot of wealth and riches now because God has blessed you. Don't let that get to your head. Don't let this wealth get to your head and forget the fact that you were a bondman in the land of Egypt. God delivered you out of that by His grace and His mercy. And hey, every single one of us today, we were all in bondage to our sin. All of us. We all were in bondage to that sin. We all deserve death. But when we got saved, God freed us from that bondage. Right? Don't forget that. Don't forget where you came from. Don't, and hey, if God blesses you with material wealth, God blesses you with vineyards and, and a lot of money or whatever, 
Don't forget that. Okay? Don't be stingy. Don't be greedy. Don't be withholding what you have from those, especially from those in need. And that's something we learn from this. And that's why he said specifically to these people, hey, if you own a vineyard, if you own an olive yard, you know, don't go over it again. That's for, that's for these people to be taken care of. And that was what's for, for Ruth. And um, we're going to see what a righteous man that Boaz was because he completely obeyed this and actually went even further, when, especially when it came to Ruth. But we're going to see why he did that. Flip back to Ruth chapter 2. But we see that from the Old Testament that that was a commandment of God. Ruth is doing what she's supposed to be doing to help support them. That is, that is, that is God's design to take care of them, to, to take care of the widows, which her and her mother and mom both were widows. So she was going to go to glean. And, and to go pick up that food so they could be supported. They, they, they have no man to go out and work and to provide for their family. So they need to go and get their food somehow. So this is what they were doing. And um, this is kind of actually, you know, th this whole concept is a, is a major theme to this chapter. And we're going to see, you know, I told you before, the book of Ruth is very symbolic. And we're going to get into that here with Boaz. And really, and really, Boaz is symbolic of the Lord Jesus Christ. And just, just keep that in mind. He's a, he's a type or a symbol of Christ to come. Keep that in mind now as we're going back and reading these verses. Because you'll, you'll start to pick up some things, maybe even things I don't, I don't quite touch on. A lot of the similarities and, and the attributes that you see coming forth out of Boaz is symbolic of Jesus Christ. Look at uh, verse number 4. Or verse number three, um, she says, And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. So she goes out, she goes out to reap and, and to glean, and she just, you know, by chance happens to be in Boaz's field. And she doesn't know who he is yet. So she's just, she just went out to glean in wherever she could find grace, wherever people wouldn't run her off, because not everybody, even though it's God's law, doesn't mean everyone's obeying God's law. Right? I mean, you're going to have people out there saying, get off my field. You are not taking this food or what, you know, whatever. And, and Boaz, we'll see later, he makes it clear. He's saying, look, I told my reapers not to, you know, not to, not to scold you and, and not to touch you and just to make sure that, that you're, you're okay and that you, you're, you know, you're allowed to do this. Um, so she, she goes off and she's out in the field of Boaz. Verse number four says, and behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Now, I love, I love this greeting, this exchange. It just, I mean, it's one simple verse, but we see Boaz, he comes in, and he, and he comes out to his field where, where his servants are doing his work for him. The reapers are out there reaping for him. And the, the fields all belong unto him, and they're out there reaping. And he comes up to him, and he says, The Lord be with you. And they answer, The Lord bless thee. So right off the bat, we start seeing, you know, Boaz is probably a godly guy. Now, you can't always judge just based off of someone's greeting, right? I mean, a lot of people talk a spiritual talk, and they're not necessarily walking the walk. But Boaz is doing both. And I just kind of like that greeting anyways. Like, how often do you even hear that? Just, just you come up on your servers, you come up on your workers. You imagine that being in the workplace and, and your boss coming up to you and being, hey, the Lord be with you. And you're like, you know what? God bless you too. That would be cool. I mean, that would be, be, be a nice place to work, I think. I mean, that would be someone, you know, people giving God um, that kind of reverence and respect and just being part of your, your daily conversation. Um, I, I think that's just, that's interesting that, that he says that that's how he's, he's speaking, communicating with his reapers, with his employees. Look at verse number five. It says, Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, whose damsel is this? So he sees, he sees Ruth and he's, he asks about her. He's like, who is that? Verse number six, and the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, it is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. And again, we see just a little bit more to her hardworking character when they said, she hath continued even from the morning until now. So she, she was out there first thing in the morning, started working, and she they basically he's like, she's been working all day until now. And I, it looks like she took a break for a little bit in the house, but she's been working the whole time. And then um, let's keep reading here. Verse number eight says, Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter, 
Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. So we see here, Boaz is speaking to Ruth. He's saying, okay, look, I want you working in my fields. Don't go and, and work in someone else's fields. Hey, you, you work with my maidens. You, you join yourself with them. And, um, and you reap here. Don't go after anyone else. And he's saying, look, haven't I just I charged my young men that they shouldn't touch thee? So Boaz is looking out for her. He's protecting her. He's making sure that she's going to be taken care of. And, he, and, he's, and he's charging her, you know, don't go work for anyone else. I want you here. And he, want, he wants her there to, to be able to take care of her. And um, I think it's interesting here, again, a little, a little bit of symbolic reference of what's going to come with Jesus Christ. He says, when thou art a thirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Right? I mean, what did Jesus Christ say? Hey, all that are a thirst, come. And you may drink of the, of the living waters freely. Right? And, and that's exactly, basically what Boaz is saying to Ruth here. He's saying, when you're thirsty, go and get yourself a drink. And, and, and um, it's just one of those cool references here. And that's, that's just the beginning of this. Let's keep reading here. Look at verse number 10. It says, Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me? seeing I am a stranger. So again, we see that, that humility, that humble attitude where, where she bows down to the ground. I mean, he just tells her, you know, like, I want you to work here. I'm looking out for you. Hey, if you're thirsty, get a drink. You know, my servants aren't going to touch you. You're going to be able to glean here and everything's going to go well. And, um, and she just bows down. She's just kind of floored by this. She bows down and just says, you know, why have I found grace in nine eyes? She's, you know, this shows you the view that she has of herself. She's not puffed up. She's not proud. She's not thinking, well, of course you better take care of me because I'm, you know, I'm helping out my mother-in-law and I'm doing this and I'm doing that and, and, and rail and listen off all of her good works. She's saying, no, why, why, would, why would you take grace on me? You know, why, why me? Why would, you, why would you care for me so much? And this is the same attitude that we ought to have. And again, you think about with Jesus Christ and the, great, the amount of grace that he's had towards us. And she says here too, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger. Right? A stranger means she's a foreigner. She's not, a, she's not in Hebrew, right? She's not of the children of Israel. So now she's asking all the more, well, why, why are you taking grace? Why are you showing this mercy on me and bestowing such abundant grace on me, seeing I'm a stranger? I'm not even of your people. And um, this is exactly, this is really important for, you know, important understanding for salvation. And especially for us Gentiles. Right? God shows His mercy. It's not just for His people. It's not just for the, you know, the chosen people, the people of Israel. God's mercy extends to everybody. And, and we ought to have this type of a humble attitude with God to where we would not think highly of ourselves and highly of our works and, oh, yeah, we're deserving of, of your grace and, and, and of the things that you give us, God. No, we should rather just be like, why would you look, why, why me? I'm a sinner. I'm a, you know, I, I'm nothing special. Why would you t take the grace on me? And, um, and it's a great attitude. Let's keep reading here. Look at verse number 11. It says, and Boaz answered and said unto her, so Boaz answers her, tells her, it hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Now there's two things here. There, there's, there's two points, and we don't want to get them confused. You don't want to get them mixed up, because there's two things that are going on here. One, in that last phrase of verse 12, says, under whose wings thou art come to trust. I want the Lord God of Israel. 
He's basically saying, like, I know you're saved. You, she put her faith in God. That's why she left her, her land, she left her family, she left everything else. And she, when she told Naomi, hey, thy God will be my God, and thy people my people. She clave unto Naomi and, and unto the people of Israel and unto God. She made God her God. She put her faith in the Lord. And um, that is important to understand for salvation. Right? And, um, but the rewards that she gets, is based off of her works. So there, there's two aspects to this, right? Obviously, you get your soul is saved and you receive that grace and that mercy of, of salvation just by putting your trust in the Lord. But she also receives some extra blessings and, and some extra rewards based on her works, based on the fact that she did all these different things. Now, um, again, it, it's a great illustration for salvation. I just wanted to bring up this point because I kind of missed it in my notes. But... Um, those who, who have been brought up in an unbelieving household. This is a great example when she said, you know, why have you found grace by seeing that I'm a stranger? You know, some people grow up, they grow up in an atheistic household where people just don't generally believe in God. You might grow up in, you know, a lot of people grow up in an Islam or Catholic or a Buddhist, you know, and all these other religions. So you have this influence on you, right? And, and it's a strong, it could be a really strong influence Growing up as a child, hearing this stuff, learning this stuff, right? It could make a big impact and be a big part of your life. But we can all find grace and mercy in God's sight, you know, no matter what your upbringing is. But you're going to need to forsake those ways and put your trust in the Lord. I mean, if you grew up in a household where no one believed in God, you have to forsake that mentality. You have to forsake that belief, that mindset, and put your faith and trust in the Lord. If you grew up in a Muslim house and they taught you the Quran and they taught you Allah and Muhammad and they taught you all this stuff, hey, you're going to need to forsake that. You're going to need to leave that behind and put all of your faith in the Lord, put all of your faith in Christ. And um, the same thing with any, insert religion here. Right? Whatever it is, however it was that you've been brought up, as, Mo as Ruth was. Ruth was brought up in the land of Moab, as a heathen land, an ungodly land. They had false gods that they worshipped. She forsook it all. That is a true repentance of her changing her belief, and regardless of, of her upbringing and her consequences, hey, she's still able to to put her faith on Christ and she left all that behind her and just said, you know what, I'm just going to put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ or in the Lord here as it is. We, today we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ but um, you know, not everyone has the best start but we all have the opportunity to, to get saved. I believe that um, and, and the responsibility is going to fall on each of our shoulders individually. It saddens me when I go out and talk to people and they, and they rely on the fact that, well, this is the way that I was taught growing up, so I'm not going to change that. Because that's an excuse. And God's not going to accept that excuse. God's not going to look at you and say, oh, well, since you were brought up and taught that way, then I'm going to give you a pass. That He doesn't do that. And, and unfortunately, that's what a lot of people think. Like, that's what their faith is on. That's what they're trusting on is, well, my parents taught me this, and this is what my family does, and this is the way it's always been. So that's the, way, that's, that's the way I believe. And you know what? I'm not going to change that. And I find that more common with, with, with Catholics than anyone else because they'll say, you know what? I was born a Catholic and I'm going to die a Catholic. And I try to say, well, well look, but, but okay, you're Catholic. You believe the Bible? And I love saying that too because if you could just get people to say, well, do you believe the Bible? Right? Because they'll say they believe the Bible. They claim to. Okay, well, what? It, can I just show you this verse? And they start showing them. And you show them, and oftentimes, no, nah, I, don't, I don't believe that. I don't, you, know, you don't believe the Bible then. And they're, and they're clinging to a religion more than what religion is supposedly based on. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it, it, it's, you've, you've taken this, you know, it's supposed to be based on this, on God's Word, and it's become something else, and you're just believing in that something else instead of on God's Word. And we need to put our faith in God's Word, obviously. But that, that excuse doesn't hold up. And, um, and Ruth is a perfect example of someone who can overcome that.
and get past that. And, uh, and, that's, and that's great. That's edifying. That's, that's good news to hear that. But um, all the more reason to get the gospel out to everybody. But let's keep reading here. Look at verse number 13. It says, Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaids, handmaidens. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip of thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. So here we see, you know, of course, Ruth is comforted by 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 Boaz, by his words, the same way we'd be comforted by the words of Christ, comforted in the fact that, that he's going to watch out for us, he can take care of us, he can make sure that no harm will come to us when we're doing his work, when we're out working and, and in the fields. You know, he says, I'll make sure that, that my servants don't, you know, that the young men don't touch you. Hey, if you're going to go out and bear precious seed of God's word, and you're going to go out to the poor neighborhoods, to the slums, to the fatherless, to the widows, and, and maybe an area that, that might be considered dangerous or, or a place that, you know, if you're a certain skin color, you shouldn't go in there because you might get hurt. Hey, look, if you're doing God's work, you ought not to fear because God can make sure that you are taken care of. If you're out doing His will, and if you're out doing His work, hey, let God be in charge of protecting you. God can make sure that everything will be just fine for you if you're going to put yourself out there to be his servant and to do his work. And that's why people say like, oh, you go, to, you go to South Phoenix or you go out to this neighborhood, you go out to that. Yeah, I go out to that neighborhood. And you know what? I'm not scared. Not even for a second. And it has nothing to do with the fact that I carry a weapon with me most of the time. <laughs> that honestly, it has nothing to do with it. I am not scared because I know I know that if I am doing God's will, and I know for a fact that preaching the gospel is God's will, and I know that if I am in God's will, I have nothing to fear. I don't care where I'm led. I don't care what the neighborhood is. I don't, it doesn't matter. If I am doing God's will, I am not going to fear what man can do unto me. It doesn't matter. God is, is more powerful than any man, than any neighborhood, than, than any you know, anyone who is out to do harm or evil to me because of my skin color or, be, or because I'm a foreigner or a stranger or whatever. I mean, Ruth was a stranger in the land. And she was probably visibly a stranger. She probably didn't look like the Israelitish women looked. She probably looked different. She probably stuck out as a th sore thumb. And normally in, 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 you know, in, in any areas, it's kind of human nature to, to, to pick on people that don't look like you and, and to, you know... Um, persecute them and, 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 not, and not give them grace and mercy. That's unfortunately a common part of human nature. The people tend to, tend to group together and, 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 and exclude anyone else. And um, we see here, Boaz, the picture of Christ, was, was saying, you know what? No, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to protect you. You're going to be just among my people. You're going to be among my handmaids and my servants. No one's going to touch you. And you can stay there. And we can be confident of that same thing. And we can be comforted in the words of Christ. We will be comforted in the fact that He is powerful and He is able to, to, to take care for us. Now that second verse that we read there, I thought was really interesting because it says, And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime come thou hither. So he said, Okay, well it's time to eat. When we all sit down and eat, I want you to come here too. And it says, And eat of the bread and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. So he wants her to come and sit down at the table with all the rest of the workers, with all the rest of the weepers, weepers, reapers, <laughs> and with, you know, with everybody else. It says, And she sat beside the reapers, and he fetched her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed and left. So here we see Boaz fetched her the food and served her and gave it to her. And I couldn't help but, but think of this verse in Luke chapter 12. Turn there if you would real quick. Luke chapter 12. Here we see the servant. Here we see the, the, the stranger, right? Out working in the field. She comes back and sits down to eat. Boaz gives her a place among everybody else, not, not at her footstool, not at his footstool, not, not off in, in some corner or sitting on the floor. He gives her a place with everybody else. 
and he even serves her some food. Look at Luke chapter 12. Look at verse number 34. The Bible starts in verse 34. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. That's a parable, a parable talking about the Lord Jesus Christ coming to, to those blessed servants that when, when he comes back, when the Lord returns, that he's going to come and he's going to gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and come forth and serve them. What a, what a great prophecy. What a, what a great um, foresight here and, and great picture of Boaz coming and serving Ruth the same way that, that Jesus prophesied here in his parable in Luke chapter 12 um, for, the, for the servants who are watching and waiting for the Lord to return and were keeping and doing his work as he commanded them to do. And it says that the, that the Lord of the servants will come back and make them to sit down and serve them and, and, um, when they sit down to meet. Um, just, it's just a great, a, a great um, correlation there, not, not a coincidence, right? <laughs> Flip back to Ruth chapter 2. I'm sorry, my brain is stuttering. Ruth chapter 2, look at verse number 15. We'll keep reading here. I think that's where we left off. Verse number 15 says, And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not, and let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them, that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. So now he's even given her, he's going above and beyond what you know basically what she should be allowed to do and what she can do because he's allowing her now he's saying let her glean even among the sheaves now the sheaves would be the the bundles of of what they're reaping where they've already reaped it and and have taken it in right not just the stuff that's left behind he's saying let her glean even among the sheaves and reproach her not don't you know don't yell or don't tell her hey you can't you can't take that that's not for you He's saying, let that be open for her as well. And in verse number 16, let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her. So he's saying, let some fall on purpose. <laughs> like like you, you're gathering this stuff in, you're doing your work, you're reaping. Hey, let some fall down as you're working for her to pick up, right? Instead of, instead of doing a really good job and making sure as much as possible nothing falls because that's normally what would happen is, you know, you, people would be, they'd be working, they'd be out in the field, and then um, they'd be, you know, obviously doing a good job, but some, you know, as you're working, some things are going to fall by the way. That would be the gleanings. But he's just saying, you know, just let some fall for her. Make sure that she is taken care of. So he goes through the extra effort to make sure that, that she will be taken care of. Let's keep reading here. Look at verse number 17. The Bible said, So she gleaned in the field until even, and beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, and she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. So she basically prepares what she has gleaned, right? She, you, you get the wheat or whatever, and to prepare it, you're going to have to grind it, powder it, you know, to, to, to process it, to get it usable in a usable form. So she takes it, she beats it out, she gets the, the good stuff out of it. And it says there she had about an ephah of barley. Now, I, I wasn't able to, to, to look up exactly how much that is. I know you go to a dictionary and figure that out. I don't like going to the dictionaries because I don't trust them. I like looking at the reference within the Bible when it says like an ephah. And um, I know that one, at one of the places where I found an ephah, it was talking about the sacrifices given unto the Lord. And it was for, I think, in Homer is like the tenth part of an ephah. And it was in Homer that people would give 
for an offering unto the Lord, which would go that the priests would eat. And, and it, was a di it wasn't barley, right? But it would be something else. And, and they would eat that and make cakes out of it. So they would kind of get a meal out of an homer, which was a tenth. So she's getting like 10 times that amount is what she ended up reaping from this one day. Which, which, which seems to be, I think, I think that's quite a bit. It's, you know, when Celis is an Aoife, she got quite a bit. They, they, you know, Boaz took care of her. She came home with, with a pretty good amount of food for the day. And um, it says, and she took it up. You know, whenever she goes back to her mother-in-law. And um, she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. So when she was sufficed, she had enough. She had a sufficient amount for herself. She gave all the rest to her mother-in-law. She said, okay, this is what I need. Right? I mean, she, she needs to eat. And then just gave all the rest under her mother-in-law. Again, just... just Keeping what she needed, not anything over, not above that, not saying, well, I worked, so I'm going to get some profit off of this. She said, no, this is all I need. You can have all the rest. Um, great, a great godly woman, great attitude to have. And um, now we see Naomi sees how much she came home with, and then she wants to know, where did you get that from? You know, because she comes home and she starts asking questions. And look at verse number 19. It says, And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought, and said, The man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living, and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. So here we see that now, now Ruth understands, and because um, she didn't know up to this point that, that Boaz was a near kinsman or anything like that. She was just going out and trying to get some work in the field and, and try to glean. Boaz showed this great mercy and extended kindness unto her. Naomi realizes, she says, You know, who did you work with today? Where did you get all this stuff from? And she tells her, Boaz, and, and she says, basically, you know, she's real thankful that, that he hasn't forgotten her and hasn't forgotten them and, um, and explains to Ruth that he's near of kin unto them, one of our next kinsmen. Look at verse 21. And Ruth the Moabite has said, He said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens that they meet thee not in any other field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. So her mother-in-law is saying too, yeah, you know, like, don't go out in anyone else's field. You need to stay here. You need to stay by Boaz. You need to stay with his servants and, and glean in his fields. And obviously he's taking care of her, so it would be kind of silly to go in anyone's field, anyone else's field anyways. But, um, you know, since since he's doing all this for him, that would be an insult even to go to someone else's field and to go work for them. And we're going to see how the, how the rest of this plays out in chapters 3 and 4. Great story, lots of symbolism. You know, I, I didn't dig into everything um, with the symbolic references of Boaz, but you can see with the, with the amount of mercy that he has and the way he presents himself, and even a little bit later here in the, in the, in the book, he is a very dutiful man. And, Moa and, and Ruth was a very dutiful woman doing that which they were supposed to do and just basically living according to God's laws and doing that which is right. We don't see, you know, um, we don't see them doing anything out of line or, or out of God's commandments or out of God's will. It's a very, very good, um, very good examples in Boaz and in Ruth. And this is going to be very important. We're going to see, I think, in, in the next chapter, how, in the fourth chapter, how, it's, um, how important it is with them basically being the, in, the, in the line of King David and very closely related. But we'll get to that in the next chapter. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. God, I thank you for this, for this chapter and for this whole book of Ruth. God, there's so much symbolism here. There's so much for us to learn. I know I barely kind of scraped the surface on some of these concepts, dear Lord. But um, there's so much for us to learn. I pray that you would please just continue to open up our understanding. Open up our wisdom, dear Lord. Um, help us to, to be humble. And especially if we become wealthy, if we become rich in this world, 
that we would never get lifted up with pride and, um, and, and curse you or, or say, you know, who is the Lord and think that we've gotten all this wealth, wealth under ourselves. Help us never to forget that we were under bondage before we were saved and um, to show mercy unto those that need mercy, dear God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.